that was given to me is uh, projected here. Traffic engineering and planning was what is given to me. I corrected a little bit to call it as traffic engineering and transport planning. Okay. Why is it so? I did I correct it? No. Okay. You are not used to answering. So, let's, let's move on. So, what is traffic engineering is uh, they will edit whatever they uh, don't want from here. So, what is traffic engineering as per your understanding? I need answers. There is no way otherwise I can teach. Traffic engineer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. But that what is that life cycle include? Different tasks. Uh -huh. Before construction there is one more thing. Yes, planning. Uh, then construction. Okay, good. You looked at the slides, I guess. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's come back, come back. So, uh, stop, stop, stop. So, this is what I got when I searched in the um, Google pictures, Google images, what is traffic engineering. So, I see uh, intersections, interchanges, vehicles moving. Uh, what else you see? Then there is one which is having lot of text saying traffic models, traffic control, traffic monitoring, intelligent transportation systems. <coughs> so all these are covered by what he said is what I believe. So let me look at, show you the simplest definition I saw in a website, which is a very simple website. It says traffic engineering is a branch of civil engineering that uses engineering techniques to achieve safe and efficient movement of people and goods. Very simple, right? And it conveys what traffic engineering is all about. It's all about moving people and goods from one place to another. The major conditions that you add is uh, safe, efficient and economic movement. So, this is what the traffic engineering is. And why do we do this? There are mainly three problems which we talk about. One is congestion, the other is uh, safety, the third is pollution or uh, you know, emission. So, when you say we have to design this system, we are talking about how do we address these problems or design the thing such that these problems are minimized. And what is the problem here when you are trying to minimize some of these or when you look at these objectives, let me go to the next slide. So, the basic objectives you will see in any textbook, any, anywhere you read is uh, the uh, like safe, efficient and economic movement of people and goods. So, what is the problem here? I have a problem in this uh, three objectives that we are talking about, ok. When you talk about safe, how do we make a traffic system safe? So, usually you talk about reducing speeds, right? That is how you talk, uh, make it more safe. But then if you want to make it more efficient, what, what should you do? You have to make the move as fast as possible, right? So, we are seeing some conflicting objectives in the whole process. That's the that's the difficulty. So we always look for the optimum way of handling these problems. How do we make them move fast enough and safe enough? But it's again you can't say that average is good enough. We want the minimum accident. So we cannot say 50 percent is good enough for you. So that's one of the major challenges you will face when you are trying to do this. <coughs> And what are all the components that we are talking about? There are mainly three components. One is what you already discussed, the infrastructure, the roadway, the railway, the air, uh, airport and all those things. The second is the moving objects there, the vehicles, the train, airplane. So that is where I am going to concentrate maximum in this discussion because the infrastructure is something which you already have listened to in two, two different talks. And the third component which is the most complex one is the human component in it. There is always a driver, there is always a pedestrian who is involved in the system. And that component is not under your control. In the sense it is not easy to model it into your uh, you know, equations or anything because human behavior is very complex, right. So the challenge in terms of modeling this traffic movement once the infrastructure is there, the most complex part is how do we characterize the driver behavior. For example, different people will de behave differently for the same situation, right? So, how many of you have driving license? 
behind these two. Two wheeler at least. Two wheeler at least you have, right? So you and your friend drives, you don't behave the same way when you have the same situation in front of you. You yourself may not behave the same way for the same situation at different time periods. So if you have to kind of capture this behavior into your uh, models, it becomes highly complex, right? So these three components, each of those, how do we handle? For uh, the other part, vehicles, if you take, even if you restrict to the road, uh, roadway movement, there are uh, bullock carts, there are two wheelers, there are auto rickshaws, up to trucks. How do we kind of incorporate all those different types of vehicles into the design? right for management how will we do that so and and what you need is finally a system which is as uniform as possible right you you, you don't want different or you don't see different roadway for two wheelers and different roadways for trucks right that's correct so the the another challenge which you are going to see is you have varied components in the sense you have different types of vehicles different types of uh, users and uh, you want to provide roadways and the system which is very uniform. So how do we handle these uh, challenging problems is uh, one of the problems we will talk about. So before getting into how do we do that, uh, what are the classifications of these systems? So you classify the system based on what technology you use, what service you provide, who operates it, what are all the medium. So, each of this, do you understand when I say what mode, for example, is it rail versus air versus roadway, for example. That's one of the ways. <coughs> so by mode, you can see these are all the different ways in which one can commute from one place to the other. Simplest being walking, running, whatever you want to. Then there are different types of vehicles, you can uh, roadway uh, vehicles. Then there are boats, ships, aircraft, all those. So in, in some way, if you group this, you can say there are land transportation, air transportation and water transportation. Each of those have a bunch of different types of uh, vehicles. A different way of looking at the classification is urban versus, uh, you know, intercity travel, travel, freight versus passenger movement. How, so each of these has uniquely different ways of handling. So these are all different ways of uh, <coughs> um, classifying the system. Now coming to the formal definition of uh, traffic engineering, uh, what we saw was a very simple crude way of starting saying that, you know, move people and goods from one place to another. Here is the definition you will see in any textbook for example and this is restricting it to the road, uh, roadways alone. It says it's planning, design, operation and management. What he repeated is what the formal definition is. So these are the stages you will go through when you have to do a complete design or complete system development for transportation. And each of these uh, terms, planning, design, operations, management, I will explain in one, one slide. Each of this is a separate course eventually. You have two undergrad level transportation courses which will cover all these in a very brief way. Then there are separate courses for each of these which will cover the complete details. So what's planning, uh, what's design, what's operations and what's management? Design is what you heard little bit already from the other lectures I believe. It's talked about how do you design the permit for example. If there is a traffic node, how do you design the roadway? But even before designing you have to plan the system. So why, why is it important? One characteristic of uh, this transportation is you don't usually, usually you don't make a trip just for the sake of it. You don't go for a drive, okay, very rarely, maybe one person you will do just for the thrill of riding a bike or something you will do. But most of the time you are traveling for some other purpose. Either you are going to your class or you are going to a movie, you are going to visit someone. So there is an end reason for you to make the trip. So that's what is meant by the derived, uh, there is a term called, uh, it's a derived demand. So the, the trip you make is related to some other activities. Most of the time it will be socio-economic related things. So the land use plays a major role in what trips happen, correct? 
if it's a recreational area, the trips are mostly to visit the place. If it's a residential area, the trips are usually people want to go to their workplace or they want to go to their colleges. If it's a shopping area, people go for shopping, obviously. So each of this trip is related to the land use of that area. So the planning part kind of links the land use to the trip that you make. So when you say you want to plan something or when you want to plan a transportation system, you start with the land use of the area. So if uh, let's say somebody says that they want to move uh, the capital from Chennai to some other city. So you will have to design the entire transportation system there. So you will start with looking at different zones in that area. What is the land use of each of that area? Then you start planning. So how do we do that? And usually this planning and design is done for a period of around 20 years, 15 to 20 years. So the planning part has four major steps. I am not going to get into the details. But it's, they are called trip generation, trip distribution, model split and uh, route choice. So what we are saying is first you want to find out how many trips are generated from each place or how many trips are attracted to each place in the first step, first stage. Second stage what you are doing is you are trying to say from this zone to this zone this many trips happen. That's the trip distribution step. <coughs> Then you are looking at how many of those trips are done in different modes, two wheelers, how many cars, how many public transport, how many. And the last part is which route each of these trips happen. So at the end of this fourth stage, you know from each zone to each zone, how many trips happen by each mode through which route. You understand? So at the end of this, you know that this route, this many two-wheelers and this many cars have to go. Then you get into the design where, where you will use this information to design what type of roadway you need, how much thickness you should give, what material you should use and all those. So that is the next stage which is the design. So there you are looking at how do I define this system or the roadway. So you will be getting into what I said as the hard side of it, basically you are looking at how do I do the characterization of the material, how do I design the thickness, how do I check the stress constraints so that is generated, whether it is safe, whether it will crack, all those information you need. So this is more of the structural design of the roadway, that is one part. You would have heard some lectures on structural design of buildings, similar to that you are talking about structural design of roadways. Once that part is done, the other part is the geometric design where you are looking at how do I design the curves, how do I make sure that the vehicles are not thrown out when you are negotiating a curve or how do I make sure that a vehicle do not slip back when they are climbing an uphill. So you have to make sure it is done correctly. So that is the geometric design part of it. As I said, each of this is a separate course. Geometric design of highways is one, one separate course and uh, is uh, offered from the transportation industry. So, this is the second stage. So, it was planning, design. Third is what is called as the operations. How do we control or manage the vehicular movement on a roadway? So, there is no way you can communicate with the driver. As an engineer, you do not communicate with the driver by calling, hey, you cannot go this way. So you need some kind of media to communicate with your uh, driver, that is what this operations mainly is, it is mostly about signs, markings and signals. You would have seen all of these, so markings are on the roadway, signboards sit in the roadside and then signals sit there either in the roadside or across the road. So these three kind of tell you how you should behave in a roadway. So the operations usually is how do you design the signals, how do you make sure the signs are correctly placed and correctly conveying the information that it should be. So it is it, again separate course which is on signal design, signal analysis and uh, all that. The last part is mostly on the management. Once you have this, how do we handle uh, the traffic still, you know, in terms of mostly you see this being done in India by the traffic police. Right, suddenly the traffic police decides that this road has to be a one way because there is, there is problem. Ideally it should be done by traffic engineers but uh, here mostly the uh, police people do that. 
but these are different ways in which one can manage the traffic once you have the roadway done, signals in place and all. Okay. So, having said these four steps, uh, planning, design, operations and management, we will mostly concentrate on the operations and management part. That is what the soft traffic side of it. So, you have the planning done, signal design, uh, sorry, roadway design done and how do we make sure they are moving efficiently, right? That is what uh, this is. So, one major part is you have to model the traffic. You have to kind of, you have seen, you know, modeling of different things. For example, rocket, if you have to design. First, you start with equations that will design and decide how it is going to move, how it is, you know, trajectory is going to be all those. Similar way, you have to have models which will characterize how this traffic is moving. It is in one way to find out how this traffic is going to behave at different time and different locations. That is what the modeling is trying to do. And for doing that, you have to collect lot of information, traffic studies will come up and then the modeling part, which can be uh, statistical modeling, it can be mathematical modeling, it can be just data driven models, empirical models, all those. But some way you want to model and the other question is how do we model this system? There are vehicles. Then there is all the vehicles moving on the roadway, then there is the city level network. So, which one you, do you model? That is where these terminologies come. There are microscopic models which are individual vehicles, how do they move? The macroscopic models kind of come out with equations or ways in which you will know how the traffic as a whole is moving. Then there is network level, in the city level if you want to model, you do not do even at a very broad stretch how the traffic is moving. So, how do we do it at the network level? Each is challenging in its own way because for example, if you take microscopic level, how one vehicle will follow its leader? It is challenging because it heavily depends on the human behavior, the driver who is sitting in the uh, vehicle. So, how do we include all these into the modeling and have some reasonably good model is what comes under the discussion in traffic flow modeling. And this is something which is more recent, by recent I mean in 70s it started, but still the other things are 30s, so 1930s, this is in 1970s, what is called as intelligent transportation systems, many of you would have heard this term I hope. So, what we are talking about is so far whatever we talked was done in a very traditional way, you know, you collect some data by going there, manually collecting, analyze it, come out with something with the latest technologies in terms of sensors, in terms of communication, in terms of analysis, there are new ways in which you can handle these problems, whether it is operations or whether it is management. So, that is what the intelligent transportation system is. So, this is again a textbook definition. It says that any advanced communications control, electronic, computer related technologies being used in traffic. That is what the intelligent transportation system is. So, I will just quickly discuss a little bit on IPS because the latest trends uh, in terms of connected vehicles, automated vehicles, all those comes from this uh, starting point of ITS. So, ITS, there are many examples. Your Google um, driver assistance is a classic example of a ITS technology. What do you get there when you are using a Google Maps? When you start your drive, usually you do, right? Whoever is driving, keep the Google map ready there. This is my origin, this is my destination, which route I should take or how much time it will take, right? How is Google coming out with that information? Any thoughts? It's okay, they are recording, but that's fine, you can talk. No thoughts? How is Google coming out with this information that, you know, this much time it will take for you to reach this point? Hmm? Satellite. No, how, how will satellite get that information? Okay, it is all coming from your cell phones, okay. If you use your Google Maps, there will be some fine print somewhere there that your data will be used and many of you are using it, so they know roughly what is the traffic situation in that road at that time. And they have their own analytics in the background to, to calculate and tell you, okay, this is roughly the time it will take. And this may be the best route to take at this point. Right. So, there are many examples that you can, you have seen already. For example, route guidance, 
Google is one example. Pictures like or uh, message boards like this, which will tell you which route to take, how much time it will take. Or bus arrival prediction, area traffic control, signals being advanced. The current signals which you see, for example, have static time. It always have this much time of green, this much time of yellow, and this much time of red. And there are times in which you go there, you are in a red, the other side is not having any vehicle, but they have a green. Right? It's kind of frustrating. So, how do you make it advanced? If you, if there is a way to collect the information from each of those legs and process it and tell, okay, this leg there is no vehicle, so don't give any green. This leg has uh, uh, vehicles waiting, give green. So, if it can happen in real time, that's an example of ITS. So, what did it uh, do? It collected the real time data, processed it, found out what is the best way to handle it and then changed the signal accordingly. That's a classic example of an ITS application. Right? So, if you look at any ITS implementation, the four major components is sensing the data, communicating the information, processing the information and then deciding what to do. Or, you know, actuators which will kind of give back this information to you. So, this needs lot of sensors, obviously, right? The sensors can be at different places, it can be in the vehicles, it can be in the roadway, it can be in the you know, human being. So, and with the advancement that's happening, there are enough sensors that gets deployed into your vehicles for definitely there. Within you, for example, your cell phone is a very good sensor. It gives lot of information. Then roadside, there can be enough sensors. So, slowly we are also reaching there. Many other countries already have sensors deployed everywhere and all these sensors are communicating with each other which leads to what are called as this V2X communication, internet of things. You must be hearing all these terms, right? So, every device or every component of the system is now giving information to each other. They can process this information and know how the traffic is moving. So, these are different uh, ways in which you can have sensors in a vehicle or roadside. Right? So, as I said, this leads to what are called as internet of things. Communication can be vehicle to vehicle, V2V, V2I, V2P. So, in general, V2X, vehicle to anything. Communication can happen. And this is the basic component or basic concept from which these connected vehicles, this is one of the hot topic you will hear, connected vehicles. That happens because of all this information and yes, once you have lot of sensors, lot of data. So, you have to get into data analytics. So, a lot of uh, information can be processed. If you ask me, I am still somebody who believes, uh, you know, back to mathematical modeling is best. But I am getting proven to be wrong. There are places where lot of data actually gives you enough information than a mathematical equation can capture. So, there are cases where lot of data is available, it can make sense. So, there are, uh, at least you know, Google and all are using big data analytics today. They have lot of information with them, they have just processed. They don't try to understand the physics of the problem. They just look at the data and the behavior and the pattern so that they will, they will be able to give you information. So, as I said, this leads to what are called as the connected vehicles and automated vehicles. You, you must have read about this Google's driverless cars and all those things. There are enough countries where they are already running in the roads. Will it come to India? It needs time, it needs lot of time because we have a very unique way of driving. But in many other countries, we have these kinds of vehicles. So, all these, the starting point is having enough sensors and enough communication happening. That was uh, kind of quickly giving you an overview of various uh, things that can come up in this uh, traffic engineering and planning side. Having said that, I thought I will just tell you where, what's the Indian context to all this. So, so some of you may be thinking, why are we talking about connected vehicles and all when we are still building infrastructure? It can happen in parallel. Also. So, this is uh, one way of looking at it. You, you again would have heard about the smart city initiatives of the current uh, government, previous term itself. So, mobility is one of the verticals under the smart city initiatives and that's what I have highlighted. 
they have given some examples smart parking and uh, intelligent traffic management integrated multi model integration and things like that but it's not that these are all the only things they are interested in anything where you can use technology to make the traffic move better so that's where some of these uh, things can make sense these are some of the details i collected from that website where they talk about what mobility features they are interested in let's not worry about it but what i am trying to say is under the smart city initiative there is a lot of interest in terms of having such developments to be done and yes i have to do some pr work also to excite you so these are some of the activities that that are happening in our lab in related to this its or traffic operations management also so i'll just briefly show you some of the examples just uh, to show what your seniors have done many of the work which i am showing are done by undergrad students either as part of the curriculum mostly they were interested so they just start working on it so i have put uh, mainly the activities are we have developed a laboratory which is uh, i will i will show you some pictures and we have a test bed live test bed from where we are getting data then we have developed lot of sensors which work for our traffic conditions then some of the solutions we have developed and implemented so as i said one of the the tasks i have divided into four headings one is the lab development and the test bed sensors then data analysis and the solutions that we develop this is the picture of our lab any of you can come and see the lab when if you are interested we will make sure so before i get into the details why do we have to do this right i don't think i have to explain much you know that our traffic is completely different from what you have seen elsewhere and all the models all the solutions that are developed are actually for the traffic which is lane based and homogeneous by lane based i mean them in one lane you expect only one vehicle they move one after the other they don't move parallelly within the lane which we happily do we don't believe in this you know follow the leader behavior we will occupy any space available so it it in one way interesting we are using the whole available space we don't want to waste anything but the problem is modeling it becomes extremely difficult because you don't know how the vehicle is going to behave right any gap you see a two wheeler fellow can move in whatever way so how do we handle that so any solution that's already available we can't use we have to kind of redo the whole thing to meet this requirement of lane uh, less movement the other is heterogeneity we have all types of vehicles there are some 16 different types of vehicles that can be running on our road so the typical us road if you look you have cars you have trucks the top very small percentage of truck maximum number of cars so it's again very simple way of handling so as i listed heterogeneity is one challenge plain discipline is another these two together gives you enough uncertainty is randomness so any model which you develop should actually be handling this randomness than the actual behavior so your thing should be able to take into account the uh, stochasticity in the model so this you don't need you know what the plain discipline is so why i said that is many of you otherwise may wonder why should you do this this is already done in other countries right most of these solutions or most of these things already is happening why do we have to because we have a unique way of uh, handling so as i said we have a lab and a test bed the lab is just a place where we are receiving all the data the test bed is the interesting part so we have a 15 km corridor around iit sp road it corridor you may not be knowing at least some of the chennai will know so it's it's uh, all the roads outside which are surrounding the iit campus the iit is actually so and we have kept enough sensors in those roadways uh, there are some i i have the details so this is the first time an academic institution did that actually even non academic institution places where they don't have it so we have real time data coming from field we are processing it we are having algorithms running solutions being given back to the user so the complete cycle we have in implemented in uh, this small corridor what are all the sensors we have around 300 mtc buses with gps sitting and sending the data to our lab 
every 5 seconds or 10 seconds. We have around 32 video cameras relaying their feed to our lab. So then uh, we have message boards which we have installed in the field which gives information back to the users. And there are other several sensors which I have enlisted. All of them are sitting in the field and uh, sending us data. And many of the students were involved in developing sensors. So this is not purely a civil engineer's work alone. We collaborate with electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, engineering design. I have a slide showing all the collaborators. So we work, so I usually joke about this. If you, some of you may be, you know, feeling very bad that you wanted to be an electrical engineer or computer science engineer and you ended up in field. These are ways in which it, there is no fixed territories these days. It's all interdisciplinary. Nobody stops you from working in any of the topics you want. So this is one of the areas in which a lot of my students work with electrical engineering faculty. Developing sensors. We have developed at least four different sensors which are working and giving information uh, in a much better way than any of the available sensors. Details I don't have time so I am not getting into. So obviously we have a good database, lot of in, you know, data that's coming from all these sensors. And uh, communication we are using various uh, technology, GPRS, wireless data transmission regular uh, wired connection, 2G, 3G modems, etc, etc. Lot of modeling that happens, uh, which uh, again I can't get into the details, but starting from very simple empirical models to, uh, you know, mathematical models to data analytics, all, all are happening. So depending on your interest, you can pick what you want to try out and then you will be some of the applications which we have developed include uh, bus arrival prediction system. What you see as the picture there is actually a live system where you can go click on the route number, it will show the bus stop, you can click on the bus stop, it will show when the bus will come. So if there are multiple bus routes, it will show these are all the route numbers, which one you want, you can click and it will show. So there are many solutions that were developed as I said, most of them are uh, undergrad students work. And I will stop with what are some of the challenging problems which are often, which if you get interested you want, you can work on. For example, uh, dynamic scheduling, no city is doing that, they all have this fixed schedule saying every 20 minutes one bus has to be, or every 30 minutes one bus has to be. Doesn't make sense, peak hour you may need more, off peak hours you don't need. So. How do you handle this in a dynamic way? Depending on the actual traffic situation, how will you schedule? Each of this problem as I have listed is an interesting open problem which uh, can be worked on. Mobility as a service for example, this uh, Uber, Ola kind of system which works completely different from a bus, completely different from a traditional taxi service. So how do we handle the scheduling, the routing, how do we do that? All those are, as I said, interesting problems. I don't know whether I will skip this as an undergrad student may not be of interest to you. Like basically, I was trying to tell what are all the challenges if you want to do this. One main challenge, as I said, is it's not a traditional civil engineers topic anymore. You have to work with multiple domains, so it's very interdisciplinary in nature. And it's very difficult to transition and uh, that needs to be Okay, so that's the last slide. As I said, uh, we collaborate a lot in terms of uh, bringing all these solutions. You can see civil engineering, computer science, chemical, electrical, engineering design, management studies. So various faculty members we work with. So as I said, it, it's something which if you wanted to be in a different uh, department, here is a way you can still manage that. Okay.